<laughs> Our last presentation today um, is with somebody really everybody knows. Um, and the reason why we're here today, um, you know, I've, I've grown up um, being taught by Dr. Sugarbaker, not directly, but from afar. And, and when you think about where we are, the, the paradigm of uh, perineal surface malignancies, everything we discuss today is a result of the work that Dr. Sugarbaker performs. And Dr. Escaval is in the audience shaking his head, and he's, and I am, I think all of us are, are, are grateful for the work that Dr. Sugarbaker performs. We, we stand on the show, we, we go through our careers and we stand on the shoulders of giants when we're talking about treatment paradigms. I think it's right on to say we stand on the shoulder of a giant, Dr. Escaval. Dr. Paul Sugarbaker is a, a, is, a, is a giant. He's the reason why we're doing what we're doing today. And, and for the patients in the room and who, who have been treated, this is the, the, the doctor who is why we're here today. Um, it's humbling for me to present an icon in American surgery, Dr. Paul Sugarbaker. Um, you know, our, our auditorium is filled today because, and I was just joking with uh, Dr. Sugarbaker last night, we call it the Sugarbaker factor. And uh, everybody wants to hear Dr. Sugarbaker. There's, there's a reason why Dr. Sugarbaker is the final speaker, because we want the room to remain filled. And, um, you know, it's an honor to have Paul Sugarbaker here. And uh, as a student, as a colleague, and as somebody we all look up to in the field and treatment of this disease. Dr. Sugarbaker. So it, is, it is a great privilege for me to, uh, to be here again and uh, to uh, tell you uh, what's happened uh, maybe in the last six years or so in the uh, management of uh, appendiceal malignancy but but also uh, the management of gastrointestinal and gynecologic malignancy as a whole and I'm going to add to this uh, formidable uh, packet of things you have here this textbook recently uh, published called Cytoreductive Surgery and Perioperative Chemotherapy for Peritoneal Surface Malignancy. And it's, uh, it's got quite a, a, a respectable list of uh, Naoul Bakrin from Lyon, who's done really the sentinel work in ovarian cancer, Marcello Doraco, we all know Marcello for his work with peritoneal mesothelioma, Olivier Glehen, Olivier Glehen may save HIPEC, for colorectal cancer. He's, he's the obstacle of Francois Kinnett trying to do it in. <laughs> um, David Morris, of course we all know David Morris, and uh, then Kurt Vanderspeeten, who's very much interested in the perfect high-pec. So anyway, I leave that with you and um, how long shall I take? 20 minutes? As long as you want. Oh my gosh. <laughs> We're here for you, Dr. Sugarbaker. We got you back. Thank you very much, Dr. Sugarbaker. Okay, it's a great pleasure. So, one of the first things I would like to say is that seeds are really important. You know, the little, what is it? It's a great, great oaks from little acorns grow. Well, um, we're, we're focused here on appendiceal neoplasms, but this, and, and this is where we started. Pseudomyxoma was the first success story of the management of uh, peritoneal surface malignancy. But we have, we have matured to become standard of care for peritoneal mesothelioma. And all those patients were dead within a year and median survival now is, is like five years. And 70% of those patients are uh, are doing well long term. That's just absolutely amazing. We're standard of care in many institutions, not all of them, but we've got some very good data that supports uh, uh, our work in the other malignancy that has a very high incidence of peritoneal seeding, like appendix, yes. 60, 80, large number of patients will have peritoneal seeding as they present and this is another one of those malignancies where 80 plus percent of the patients are going to have peritoneal, malignant, peritoneal metastases, what used to be called carcinomatosis. 
as, as they present. And we're struggling now to make an effort in colorectal and gastric. Very important application is this unusual malignancies that have disseminated to the peritoneal surfaces. And I, I can give a, a, that's one of my favorite subjects, is how many of these unusual cancers, especially the mucinous, Dr. Seligman, especially these mucinous ovarian uh, uh, malignancies, uh, sometimes not even treated, are just assaulted with systemic chemotherapy. We have a perfect solution to the problem with uh, cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC. Now, again, just to show you that this effort here at Drexel is, is, is not unique. It's, it's moving around the world. We, uh, well, we started back here in Basingstoke in 1998, and we had about 20 patients for our peritoneal surface oncology group meeting. And it was just kind of the fellows and, and uh, uh, registrars from uh, Basingstoke. And so numerous people have mentioned that uh, the, the meeting in Paris was extremely worthwhile. I'll tell you what was most exciting to me in Paris, and that is this 25 or 35 surgical oncologists, young surgical oncologists, who had as their career plan to study peritoneal metastases. Similar to our presentations, our last two presentations here. That is what we need in order to really make progress in uh, this uh, field. Um, so our, our next international meeting is going to be in Beijing. Maybe you can start practicing your uh, Chinese uh, at this uh, point in time. But uh, I'm inviting you all to come to uh, Beijing uh, September 18 through 20 of uh, 2020. Yan Li uh, is, is the coordinator uh, in Beijing for this. And he, he tells me, communication will not be a problem. I don't know exactly how he's going to do this, but this is uh, East meets West. Did, did you see in Dr. Morano's uh, trial, the greatest number of trials in peritoneal malignancy are in China. They're, they're really moving along there. This, this is going to be an exciting, is that right? Yeah. It's going to be an exciting meeting and trying. You know, they, they don't use one high pec, they use three. There's a lot of just really interesting things happening. Well, finally, the spillover of this work on appendiceal malignancy, I think, brings us to a new paradigm in the management of uh, gastrointestinal malignancy. Not just appendiceal malignancy, this applies to appendiceal, but it also applies now to virtually all the gastrointestinal malignancies. As I see them as a surgeon, okay, we, we must have proper clearance of the malignant process. You, 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 have to, you have to remove it. But in the process of removing it, you must have perfect containment. If you go in there and mess around and spill those, spill those gastric cancer cells into the into the peritoneal space, that patient is going to die 12 months later of peritoneal metastases. We, we must have perfect, the maximal, let's say the maximal containment of that malignant process. And then I, I, I think gastrointestinal surgeons as a whole now need to learn how to use cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC. I see a new standard of care uh, emerging uh, not just for appendiceal malignancy, but for gastrointestinal and gynecologic malignancy. Now, I've been asked to talk about um, current trends in the management of appendiceal cancer. I just want to mention to you that there is another tumor. Actually, it's, it's more common. The carcinoid is more common than the epithelial uh, tumor. We, we, we need to know how to manage it. Um, the current standard of practice for carcinoid tumors is appendectomy alone for tumors less than two centimeters or a right colectomy for tumors greater than two centimeters. And this is the world's 
uh, um, complete data for that uh, uh, right colectomy. There's no survival data. It's just that uh, uh, this uh, uh, nice report uh, where they looked at uh, uh, a large number of carcinoids, they found out greater than two centimeters had uh, about this 25% uh, involvement of lymph nodes. And since that time, 1996, uh, thousands of people have had their right colon removed. And I'm going to come back to this because I think it, it also is a theme for, for the mucinous tumors. Have the right colon removed. And um, we, we, have no, we have no scientific data to support it, absolutely none. So here's a problem. There's far too many negative right colon uh, resections. Improved survival following right colectomy has never been reported. As a matter of fact, nobody's ever really studied it. Lymph nodal metastases, when they occur, are easily palpable. Now, I'm talking a little bit more from an open surgery where you can actually feel the specimen than from a, uh, uh, a laparoscopic perspective. And maybe I need to kind of rethink this slide in terms of laparoscopic resections. The incidence of occult nodes is low. So, right, uh, that's a, I'm sorry, that's a misfit, appendectomy with resection of lymph nodes in the mesoappendix is necessary. And I'm going to try and present to you here not just appendectomy, but appendectomy with the relevant lymph nodes. Gives you a lot of information about carcinoids, but also about our uh, mucinous uh, tumors. Right colectomy is not indicated for prophylactic removal of occult lymph nodes Right colectomy is necessary if positive lymph nodes are palpated, are demonstrated by sampling the sentinel lymph nodes. And I'm going to try and develop that with you a little bit, this, this concept that there is a ordered progression of lymph nodal disease from the appendix, and it is along the appendiceal artery. And uh, right colectomy uh, is necessary uh, and, and, and so we would want to do the right colon resection if those lymph nodes are positive or if uh, we can't uh, obtain a negative margin by cecectomy. The artery of the appendix courses posterior to the ileocecal valve region. Resection of the three to five lymph nodes in the mesoappendix requires rotation of the ascending colon from right to left. So this is this, this tiny little structure which causes so many problems. It's said to be vestigial, but I'm not, I'm not so sure. In other words, it, it's, it's kind of a, uh, a remnant of, of our evolution. But um, right along this artery here, you will find three to five lymph nodes. And um, when the appendix is removed, and, and we're trying to, to teach this now as broadly as we can, when the appendix is removed with a scope or open, you can remove the soft tissues in and around the appendix. It gives you a, a tremendous additional piece of information for the pathologist. Here there's a, quite a large amount of soft tissue which will contain three to five lymph nodes in and along that uh, 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 appendiceal artery. You can see here the appendix has been opened, it's been bisected, the, the mucus is, is coming out of its, uh, or uh, out of the end of the appendix here, and um, this is a blowout. This is a blowout of the appendix uh, from a, uh, a mucinous uh, tumor. Now, it's a fooler. Dr. Seligman, I think this is the small uh, appendiceal primary tumor here, and you, you said we should look for calcifications in the wall. But, and it's, it's really small, it's about the size of a marble, but this, this is a, a large mass of appendiceal tumor in the left upper quadrant. And there's also some tumor here on the small bowel, the small bowel being nicely uh, opacified uh, by oral contrast. 
So the difference between a benign and a malignant mucosal cannot be determined by external in inspection. You can have one that's 15 centimeters long or five centimeters long. That doesn't tell you whether it's benign or malignant. If you remove that adenoma intact, there's an excellent prognosis. This is a data, actually rather old data, but very good data from one of our, our uh, uh, trustees, our advisors in the, in the foundation. When a mucosal is seen on CT at laparoscopy, resection without rupture, resection without rupture, with an adequate margin on the appendiceal stump is manda mandated. Always consider a generous laparotomy rather than smushing the appendix. I can't tell you how many patients I've reoperated on where the appendix uh, tumor was submitted to the pathologist in pieces, and then I'm back there a year later removing the old abdominal incision and uh, the right colectomy site and the greater omentum, and it really, it all could have been prevented if that general surgeon had come to this conference. <laughs> okay. So do we need to do right colon resection? I, I guess, I bet if I polled the patients here who had uh, uh, appendiceal malignancy and I asked how many had a right colon resection, a great majority would, would, uh, would raise your hands. And, and sometimes when you're dealing with malignancy, less is more. There's no doubt about it. When you learn more about a, a process, less can be more. So the incidence of lymph node metastases is, is small. I really believe that the sentinel node concept is for real. These lymphatic metastases don't go all over the place uh, in a, in a uh, helter-skelter fashion. They really do follow the relevant uh, lymph channels. So by the sentinel node concept, metastases to iliocolic nodes in the absence of metastases to appendiceal nodes rarely, if ever, occurs. It's a very hard thing to document with your data because we, we haven't prospectively looked at it, but as best we can determine, you just don't have positive iliocolic nodes in the absence of positive appendiceal nodes. In patients with peritoneal seeding from appendiceal cancer, right colectomy does not improve prognosis. So here's some work that Santi Gonzalez and, and I did, and this is number of patients, and this is time, and so this survival curve shows here in red people who had appendectomy alone, and the, the, the blue uh, uh, the dotted line is patients who had right colon resection, and they actually didn't do as well as the ones who had appendectomy alone. And then these are patients who had neither, probably a very advanced disease. We just don't have data to suggest that uh, right hemicolectomy should be a routine uh, uh, resection in patients with peritoneal metastases. So here's, here's my personal conclusion. Right hemicolectomy is not routinely indicated for epithelial tumors of the appendix. Mesoappendiceal lymph nodes, mesoappendix, that's the mesentery of the appendix. Mesoappendiceal lymph nodes, these are the sentinel nodes and the margins of resection on the appendix. I hope everybody here who had an appendectomy for um, a, a mucinous appendiceal neoplasm had a negative margin of resection. So those are the two really important aspects in order to make a uh, good judgment. Now, I have some data to, to, to back that up. Uh, this is a study of my own patients, uh, about 300. So the well-differentiated PMCAs, I still call them peritoneal mucinous carcinomas, so these are the adenocarcinomas, well-differentiated. Uh, only three of 44 patients had lymph nodes positive. The moderately differentiated, not much different, six of 107. These poorly differentiated, oftentimes with signet rings, they are the bad actors. They had a 20... 9% incidence of positive lymph nodes. Yes, right colectomy with the poorly differentiated or signet rings. The others, 
just carefully evaluate the base of the appendix and the ileocolic lymph nodes. And so this is what we recommend, DPAMs, just appendectomy, well or moderately differentiated PMCA, the radical appendectomy, that's appendix plus the mesoappendix, those three to five lymph nodes along the appendiceal artery, poorly differentiated, yes, you have to use a right colectomy, or if it's, quote, intestinal type. So where are we in terms of now? We had a, a lot of really very interesting presentations about where are we going. But what, what's the management plan now? Well, peritoneectomy procedures and visceral resections are performed to remove all visible evidence of disease. And then HIPEC, HIPEC is the best we've got at this point in time. Are we trying to improve it? Yes. But HIPEC is used to preserve that surgical complete response. And HIPEC is very effective. It's very effective on those tumors who don't seem to be invading into the normal structures of the peritoneal space. Low-grade sarcomas. We have a wonderful uh, 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 results with cytoreductive surgery and a, a sarcoma-specific uh, HIPEC for low-grade sarcomas and the low-grade ovarian malignancies. Exactly the same. So HIPEC seems to be very effective for these low-grade, non-invasive tumors where this HIPEC, which only penetrates into maybe one millimeter of the, of the peritoneal surface, very effective. Cytoreduction, that's the removal of all disease uh, that's visible. We want to get away from this concept of debulking or degrossing. We, we have a number of visceral resections that are required, and we have a number of peritoneectomy procedures. I wish I could pull out one of the videos from the book that uh, I just gave to Wilbur, and we could look at the five peritoneectomy procedures, because it, it actually is beautiful surgery. It, it, it uh, is, is extremely uh, clean, everything. After you finish, it's like, oh, wow. I'm so happy that we did this on, uh, on this patient. So the peritoneectomy procedures allow us to do things that in the past were completely impossible. Personally, I use the ball tip uh, because uh, I, I can move around structures like the ureter without uh, damage. We need exposure. The surgeon doesn't see either by minimally invasive uh, uh, technology or by open technology, if he doesn't see what he's doing, you as a patient are in trouble. So we want full exposure, and usually we use this uh, large uh, self-retaining uh, retractor, and, that, and, and we, we need a very large abdominal incision, an elegantly performed midline abdominal incision without hernias and without wound infections. That's got to be the goal. And of course, then we're using the ball tip here to peel down this anterior parietal peritoneum. We felt inside, we feel that there's, there are nodules on the anterior parietal peritoneum. And we're just laying this ball tip at the interface of the uh, a posterior rectus sheath and the diseased peritoneum, and it'll all come out. And you know what? You don't need that peritoneum. A lot of it will regenerate, but if it doesn't regenerate, you can have totally normal bowel function, having removed all of the parietal peritoneum. And then uh, we, we haven't seen too many pictures of, of the actual HIPEC. Jesus has showed us the closed technique, so I'm showing you here the open technique. Here's this uh, uh, retractor that kind of makes a swimming pool, kind of makes a swimming pool or a reservoir out of the peritoneal space and the skin edges are, are uh, tented up on this uh, self-retaining retractor, and we have here a, uh, a piece of plastic that covers an 
I'm in there really mixing it up. I am mixing it up. I'm making sure that uh, really no tumor cells remain uh, within uh, the peritoneal space and on these structures. This is the chemotherapy that I'm using. I only say this to say that a lot of work needs to be done to, to give us the, the, the best HIPEC. And unfortunately, unfortunately, this uh, beautiful trial that the French performed, this Prodigy 7, used a chemotherapy that had many strategic flaws and, and very serious pharmacologic flaws and only worked on about 20% of the patients. So we, we, we really need to think about the best HIPEX. And it would be a shame if we threw out oxaliplatinum as a result of the Prodigy 7 results. So I thought we might just show some results of treatment. So uh, again, I, I'm, I'm, I apologize, but Biggie Ronette and I, we, we, we invented these names, the DPAM and the PMC. I, I have trouble getting, I have trouble uh, releasing them. So DPAM is the diffuse peritoneal adenomucinosis is pseudomyxoma, and PMCA is a peritoneal mucinous carcinoma. Wow, it makes a huge difference, doesn't it, in terms of survival. So here's the percent of patients that are alive, and then this is time going out here to uh, uh, six, eight years. Um, this is a huge difference as to whether you have one a type of tumor or the other, and then a number of people have shown this P PCI or peritoneal cancer index, which is an estimate. Don't add, it's, it's an estimate of the extent of disease both on the peritoneal surfaces and on the uh, small bowel. And wow, it makes a big difference. Here, here we have again uh, the survival with the low grade or the 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 adenomucinosis patients. Um, by PCI, it makes a difference. Even in the low-grade tumors, the extent of disease makes a difference. And I might just say it makes a difference in follow-up also. So follow-up is important. PMCA is not so much uh, difference, but still, uh, with this uh, number of patients, we can see that the extent of disease is completely, is, is, is extremely important. And then perhaps the, uh, the, the most important aspect is, of this is the CC score or the completeness of cytoreduction reduction score. This is what the surgeon should be working for as he does cytoreduction reduction for any of the gastrointestinals or gynecologic malignancy, and that is um, CC zero, complete visible clearing of the uh, peritoneal space. And as you can see, with the adenomucinosis patients, the low grade makes a huge difference as to whether it all comes out. And the best time to get it all out is that first try. I'll tell you, uh, I, I don't have the, the data up here on, on um, prior surgical score, but it, you, you'd like to go to someone who really knows what they're doing the first time around. And it makes a huge difference with PMCAs also. Now, we used to get a lot of criticism uh, from uh, Massachusetts General Hospital and from the Mayo Clinic and from Memorial Sloan Kettering. You know what, America, we don't get any criticism anymore. We don't get any criticism. But you know, when they looked at their data with pseudomyxoma peritonei, they all three of them had a pretty lousy outcome with, with nobody alive long term. And then this is the data on CRS and HIPEC. It's a huge difference, even compared to the most prestigious cancer institutes. And as a result of this data, uh, cytoreductive surgery and perioperative chemotherapy washing is the standard of care with this disease. In my opinion, serial debulking is no longer a treatment option. The current standard of care is cytoreductive surgery plus perioperative intraperitoneal chemotherapy. And long-term follow-up is necessary to evaluate the results. I'm going to stop right there. Um, because uh, I don't think that uh, the data on adverse events is all, I'll just go over. So about 20% of patients who have this major cytoreduction 
will have a, a complication. About 10% will return to the operating room for bleeding or, or uh, anastomotic insufficiency. There is a risk to it. There is definitely a risk to it, but the safety and efficacy is, is definitely built into the process if you have a team effort. My conclusions, prophylactic right colectomy for carcinoid or epithelial tumors of the appendix is greatly overused and not supported by the literature. Think about the sentinel nodes that uh, are available in the appendix. An intact mucosal, careful uh, identification of the patients who are at risk by radiology and removal of that mucosal without disruption, extremely important. Superior results in the management of peritoneal dissemination of appendiceal malignancy uh, ha has been achieved with cytoreductive surgery and perioperative chemotherapy. The mortality, 1.8%, it's too high, isn't it? I don't think we've lost a patient in over 500 cases. So mortality is less than 1% and serious morbidity recent data would be about 12% because the, the, the procedures are a little less uh, extensive than they used to be. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure to be here.